Kentucky American. Thank you very much for your support. And I'm going to have Susan Luncho from Kentucky American Water to come forward to make a few comments on behalf of our presenting sponsor, Susan. Thank you, Bob. Good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of Kentucky American Water and all my colleagues at table three over there, um, we'd like to welcome you to today's luncheon. It's great to see so many of you here on a beautiful fall afternoon in the bluegrass. And um, as Bob said, um, we've been a sponsor of this series for a long time, and it's our, indeed our pleasure to be a sponsor. Um, this series has grown over the years, and we really believe it is a great value for all of the members of Commerce Lexington, others um, in the region, to come and hear from elected officials, um, from candidates for office, from, from other government officials. And so we are really proud to bring this kind of value in partnership with Commerce Lexington to all of you. And as he said, as the crowds have gotten bigger and bigger over the years, we believe that you see the value as well. And so we're delighted to see so many of you here today. Um, Lieutenant Governor, it's our privilege uh, to have you here today. Thank you for being here. And also, uh, Attorney General Conway, thank you for your time as we get to the home stretch of the race. We really appreciate you being here today, and we look forward to your comments. So thank you all again, and enjoy. Thank you, Susan. Thank you for your sponsorship, Kentucky America. I know you've got several folks here, and again, we never take you for granted. We always appreciate you. So at this point, let's turn right into the program. I'm going to turn it over to Carla Blanton. And Carla is the chair of the Public Policy Council for Commerce Lexington. Thank you. Thank you, General Conway, for being with us today. We appreciate it. Uh, I think most people in the room are familiar with the fact that you're serving your second term mm -hmm. as Attorney General, and that you were in the PAD administration. Tell us a little bit about how that background, as well as uh, being a husband and father of two, has shaped how you feel you're going to want to be a governor going forward. Wow, there's a lot in that question. First of all, let me say thank you for the remarkably comfortable chair. I mean, this is, uh, I've given a lot of interviews in the last 18 months. This thing is fabulous. It really is. I mean, I, I, uh, lumbar support and everything, so this is great. Um, <laughs> well, Carl, I'm a very different person now that I'm a father of two than I was, you know, even a decade ago. Um, and I want to take the opportunity to recognize my remarkable wife, Elizabeth, who's here with me here today. Uh, hopefully the future first lady. Um, you know, I, um, I, one of the reasons we're both so passionate about early childhood education uh, is that you know, we see the magic with our own two daughters. I, um, I, I try to read to them as much as I can. When I had more time, I read a lot to Eva. And just seeing the magic when I come home now, when I'm home in time to actually, for bedtime for the girls, to see my six-year-old reading to the, to the four-year-old is real magic. And it's something that Elizabeth and I have observed. Um, but, you know, being a father has mellowed me a little bit. Um, you know, the gray hairs are coming in faster as a result of uh, all the things that, that we deal with. When I came up in the patent administration, I came up at a remarkably young age. It was my first, you know, one of my first gigs right out of law school. In fact, I was, uh, I took the bar exam in the summer of 1995 and had a federal clerkship in Washington, D.C. I expected to take in January of 96. And so I, I had six months or so to try to figure out what I was going to do. And so I came back and worked on a governor's race. And we helped get Paul Patton elected by 22,000 votes. And um, he looked at me and basically said, why don't you stay and be legal counsel? You'll work with Crit Llewellyn and others. And, and so I stayed. You know, I had a, had a girlfriend back in Washington, D.C. at the time. And that didn't work out. And I got kind of sweet on the deputy press secretary in the patent administration, who's now my wife and the mother of my two children. And so it's kind of you know, funny how life works out that way, folks. You know, it just really is. Um, but uh, you know, along the way, I, I came under the tutelage of a remarkable professional woman in Crit Llewellyn. Um, and Crit is one of the two or three people who've had the most significant influence in my professional development. When our oldest daughter, Eva, was born on Crit's birthday, I said, well, there's a, there's a sign from the Lord. She has to be the godmother. And Crit is actually the godmother of, uh, of Eva. And the thing about the patent administration was it was just a crash course in public policy in this state. He was such an activist governor. I mean, he had so many things going on. And what Crit did and what she had brought me into the process of doing is saying, look, this governor has so much going on. He's got an overarching goal of really improving the quality of life in this state. And he wants to do it through criminal justice reforms. He wants to do it through higher education reform, through economic development. Let's come up with a strategic plan and five core strategies. And we made certainly the entire cabinet from a manage management standpoint 
was feeding into those five core strategies. So uh, uh, that organizational experience, you know, having experiences like I was the guy that sat down and put pen to paper and wrote the higher education reforms of 1997. I mean, they were Paul Patton's ideas, but I actually wrote the bill out. We did water resources legislation. Uh, you know, he, he wanted you there at 7 a.m. He didn't want you there at 7.01, he, he wanted you there at 6.59 for a meeting. And if, if you'd show up at 7.01 a.m., he'd look at you and say, good afternoon, Mr. Conway. You know, he was one of those. And, and, and typically, in a, in, a, in a governor's administration, Crit and I have talked about this a lot, there's always someone around a governor who's trying to limit access. You know, oh, you can't get to the governor unless you go through so-and-so. In that administration, whether it was me or Crit or Dennis Fleming or Jim Ramsey or Skipper Martin, there was none of that. We were like, you know, come on in. You have any, as much of this guy as you want, really. I mean, there's just, uh, he's got so much going on. But there was a real a collegial atmosphere and a focus on what we could do to move Kentucky forward. Um, and it's one of the reasons that is, hopefully as the next governor, you know, I'm thinking about things like if I were to do a higher education 2.0, you know, what would I do? We need to make certain the KCTCS is more focused on workforce development. We've got those six specific goals in the higher ed reforms from 1997. Are we going to make them? How do we recalibrate? So that, that tenure in the patent administration really influences a lot of my thinking today, along with my experience as attorney general. But uh, yeah, I, uh, I think I've got the requisite experience to do this job. You uh, briefly referenced workforce development. And there have been um, new federal workforce laws that are providing Kentucky with the opportunity to change and hopefully improve the workforce development system with an emphasis on accountability and efficiency and effectiveness and to hopefully have greater flexibility to match the needs of businesses with what the, the training and, and education that is being offered. So what might be some specific ideas that you would want to see implemented as you talked about um, higher ed reform 2.0, but specifically for workforce development, what are some things that you think need to be done? Well, it's one of the two or three most important things that the next governor is going to address is workforce development. Uh, the Kentucky Chamber of Commerce uh, had a study they came out with here a few months ago, and they identified workforce as one of the four pillars that had to be built, built upon. Um, I took a meeting not too long ago over at the Economic Development Cabinet just to see how things were going and meeting with the senior staff. And, and I was interested to hear them say that, Jack, you know, we've got a wide array of tax incentive programs in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. And, and in negotiating with companies who want to come here, we can usually get them to where they want to be on taxes. They like our quality of life. The final question we get is, okay, tell us about the workforce. How educated are they? How easily trained are they? And how addicted are they? And that's where, unfortunately, Kentucky is breaking down. And uh, we're, a, you know, we're a little bit older on average than some other states. We've had a lot of our workforce go into retirement, but yet we've created 88,000 jobs over the last few years. And as I travel around the state, I, I hear story after story. People can't find the skilled workers they need. I mean, I was in Henderson County four or five months ago, and a CEO was taking me through Sunrise Tool and Die. It's a advanced manufacturing. They're making, Carla, they were making the molds for auto parts. And they were using computers. It took a couple years of training to get the jobs. This guy had 50 employees. He was paying them on average $100,000 a year. He was looking for 50 more employees and could not find them. Could not find them. I hear the same story in Marion County. I hear the same story in, in Jefferson County, where at Ford Motor Company, they can't find enough skilled electricians to complete their expansion out there. Um, I hear it here in central Kentucky, yet I just I drove through eastern Kentucky last Friday and drove through counties that have high double-digit unemployment. I mean, we, we have to get this right, and so it's going to involve a lot of things, Carla. It's, uh, it's going to involve elevating the Workforce Development Cabinet. And the Workforce Development Cabinet has always sort of been seen as a, as a four-step sibling to the Economic Development Secretary. The Economic Development Secretary gets to fly around and try to lure companies here, but if workforce solutions are such a big part of this strategy, they have to be co-equals. As the Workforce Investment Act and the boards have changed to the Workforce Innovation Act, where there's actually a little bit more money, we have to make certain we're accountable and transparent with that money, and we're, we're putting in place the most modern workforce solutions. Our K through 12 education programs uh, have a big say in this. If you take a look at my education plan that we put on ConwayOverly.com, we propose a new initiative to do more counseling in the 11th and 12th grades, because we have a lot of students that are making big decisions about taking out student loans. And they need to know whether or not the, the degree they're going to get is actually going to lead to a job. They and their parents need to be educated about the fact that there may be $100,000 a year jobs out there in advanced manufacturing. And that type of counseling can lead us to partner up with the programs like Kentucky Fame, Skilled Apprenticeship. There are a lot of employers out there that will pay for two or three years of training if they know someone's willing to work for them for five years and they just pay off the loans. And if they don't work that long, then the loan comes back to the student. But we need to be thinking about these partnerships between employers, 
and potential employees. We need to elevate the workforce development cabinet. The Kentucky Community and Technical College system has to get better. Some schools are doing a good job, others are not. And because I was around in 1997 when we created the KCTCS, I know what we were trying to do is we took the community colleges away from the University of Kentucky. We partnered them with the technical schools and we wanted them to meet the needs of local employers. Well, I was in Northern Kentucky a couple months ago and the chamber up there told me that they had to go to Gateway. They had to go to Gateway and say, look, we need more people in IT. We need more skilled mechanics. This is the type of advanced manufacturing we need. Train to this, hire people and train to this. Well, that's backwards. That's backwards. I mean, each and every community and technical school ought to be assessing their geographic region on an annual basis in training and teaching to that. So I'm gonna lean on the KCTCS quite a bit, and I'm also gonna lean on our ad districts. There's a lot of federal workforce money flowing through these ad districts, and I'm gonna make certain that they're accountable and they're part of this solution. So there are about five prongs to this, and what the next governor's gonna to have to do is almost step back and say, let's not think about things the old way. What are we trying to do? And let's try to take these five institutions and let's redesign them and re-engineer them in a way that makes sense. And that's one of the things that I'm gonna get in the middle of and try to fix as best I can early on in my first term as governor if I'm honored enough to be elected. <laughs> and probably some of it a related question. Our labor force participation rate is the lowest it's been in 40 years. We rank about, I think, 47th uh, in terms of labor participation. Do you see that as the same issue, or are there, are there some other things at play that need to be fixed? Well, it's the same issue. It's just that it's largely driven by the demographics of Kentucky. I mean, our boomers started to reach retirement age in Kentucky right about the time the Great Recession hit. And a lot of them couldn't afford to retire, so they kept working. They kept working and kept trying to feed their 401ks. And as the economy has gotten better, a lot of them have decided to retire. Uh, in the last couple of years, and you're looking at the statistics, and this is something that you know we got into a little bit in the center debate, but we've had, you know, we've created maybe 88,000 jobs. So we've had, I think, in the last couple of years, like 44,000 people just leave the workforce because they're ready to retire. Kentucky's a, a slightly uh, older state. Um, people are retiring, and and we've got to make certain that this next generation of workforce that's coming along are prepared for the jobs that are out there. I was at an event in Louisville last night and uh, talking to someone who was involved in the historic redevelopment of the, of the Starks building. Uh, major investment. They're looking for the skilled trades to complete this project over the next two years. Can't find them in Kentucky. They're going to Illinois and Missouri and other places to, to hire them. Now, I hope those people become Kentuckians, start contributing to our tax base. Uh, but you know, the governor, next governor of Kentucky is going to have to go around and market and say, hey, guess what? If you're looking for jobs, come to Kentucky because we need workers. Uh, we're going to have to build this labor base both through the, the counseling that I'm talking about in the 11th and 12th grades, through the KCTCS, through making certain that our universities are focused on the jobs that are out there, and part of it's recruiting too. I mean, bring companies in here that are, that'll bring their workers with them. I mean, uh, I'm ready for Kentucky to grow. Uh, switching gears a little bit to tax reform, I mean, it's been talked about for years and years. There have been task forces and proposals and I think everyone agrees it needs to be done, but the devil's always in the details. What are some of the things that you think would must be key components to any tax reform package? Well, I think that if we do tax reform, first of all, I'm going to hold the line on taxes. I don't think it's time for any broad-based tax increases. But what we have in our revenue system is a revenue system that's really geared for a 1960s manufacturing sale of goods economy. That's kind of how our system is designed. Uh, Coal severance tax revenues are obviously on the decline. Um, so we obviously need to take a look at this, but, but Carla, rather than commission another study, I, I've been around long enough to know that we've had study, and then we had another study, and then we studied the restudy. Um, and and I, then Lieutenant Governor Abramson did some very good work in, in listening to people around the state and coming up with some recommendations. The problem with that approach is you've got a study and then you have a press conference but you haven't really participated in the political art of what is possible. And so as I approach this, I'm gonna look at what's been recommended in the past, but I'm gonna sit down and talk to Senator Stivers and say, what do you want going forward? I know you have some priorities. I know we both wanna move this state forward. What's possible? That's the way I will come at it because you can have a press conference, you can have studies, but if you don't know what you can get through the Republican Senate right now, then you're just wasting your time. And I, and I have a good working relationship with, with Senator Stivers. You know, I, I think the world of him, I've known him for 20 years. I think his heart's in the right place. 
Um, I have a record of reaching across the aisle when we got our prescription pill legislation passed. I reached across the aisle to work on heroin legislation. I've reached across the aisle on cyber crimes. I've had to reach across the aisle uh, in leadership positions amongst the national associations of, of attorneys general. So I, I'm willing to do that. Uh, on tax reform, you know, I, I think in a state like this where we have such a logistics environment, we ought to get rid of the state portion of the inventory tax. I think with some adjustments, we could bring the corporate income tax rate down about a quarter point uh, to make us even, even more competitive. I think every tax expenditure we have, special tax breaks that are created, ought to undergo a five-year review process to see if something is outdated, if we can't capture some revenue by doing away with outdated uh, tax expenditures. And um, those are the sorts of conversations I want to have. But I want to have it in a bipartisan basis, sitting down saying, how can we make our business environment more competitive? And how can we make certain that we provide for the needs of Kentuckians? And that's going to be, those are discussions that, you know, I've been around long enough to know that those are discussions you have to have one-on-one -on -one with people on the other side of the aisle. Otherwise, otherwise we'll spin our wheels. The challenge for a Conway administration, if there is one, and I hope there will be, um, will be from a public, public budgeting standpoint to almost escrow that money. Show the public what is coming in. So here's what we have in the general fund that we otherwise wouldn't have. And to show that we can afford this Medicaid expansion and we have to have it. Um, and I absolutely think it was the right thing to do. And look, if we get to 2021 and we can't afford this, you know, the federal government's been willing to work with Kentucky on this issue. We can always scale back. We can make adjustments. But what I am not going to do, what I'm not going to do is what my opponent has been clear he would do. I mean, he has said that, no question about it, he would reverse everything that Governor Bashir has done immediately. And Carla, that would kick nearly a half million people off of their health insurance. And I, I think that's callous. I mean, look at John Boehner up in Ohio. He, he's a Republican running for president. And he, he, he expanded Medicaid in Ohio because he told his constituents it was the Christian thing to do. I think this Medicaid expansion was the right decision. I think we do have too many people on Medicaid, but you get them off by creating a better economy and more jobs. And um, I'm going to see through what Governor Bashir has started. What impact do you think the health cooperative going away is going to have on Connect or on just the Affordable Care Act in general in Kentucky? I think it'll be minimal. I think it'll be minimal. You've got 51,000 uh, policyholders. What they're going to have to do is they're going to have to switch to a new policy in January. I mean, they had to go ahead and say this because enrollment occurs in October. Um, but, uh, you know, the co-op was kind of a startup. I think there were some management issues at the co-op. There really were. They didn't maintain sufficient reserves. Um, but the market has put them in a place where they can't go on, go on next year. But look, the state is not out one dime here. Not out one dime. If there's any shortfall, it's got to be picked up by the feds. It's got to be picked up by the feds. And uh, next year in, in open enrollment, we're going to have we're going to have seven insurers competing for the business of Kentuckians that are on Connect. I mean, a lot of you in this room probably remember the 1990s after House Bill 250 passed, and we had literally dozens upon dozens of insurers leaving this state, and there weren't, weren't really options for Kentuckians to have a vibrant exchange. It's a national model with seven insurers competing. Um, I think that's that's good. And look, you know, the, the co-op may have been able to be saved. There was actually some federal funding to prop up the co-ops, but the, the Republicans in Washington decided to defund the co-op program. That's what happened. So for the uh, for the <laughs> for the Republicans to jump up now and scream that this is a this is a failure uh, of health care reform when they defunded the co-op program, I think that's a little disingenuous. But I will be looking for opportunities in the future. If there's something comes along and, and we can make certain that we have not-for-profit alternatives in the exchange that are helping drive the right kind of competition, I will look for every opportunity in the future on that. Uh, switching to education, uh, Kentucky students have made slight improvements, uh, but low math scores tend to, to persist, especially um, and as we're looking towards student readiness for college or career, um, STEM, graduation, STEM graduates to meet the needs of employers. What would you recommend in terms of improving that math proficiency? How can we get students over that hump and into these careers? It started as early as possible. I mean, I, I know I keep coming back to early childhood education, but it's so important that the child that shows up ready for kindergarten is the one that will go on to test well. I mean, I again, when I'm home, you know, I just love it. My little six-year-old has her math worksheet. She's, you know, quizzing me on what does 12 plus 13 equal and what's it. I mean, we walk around the house and and do that. So an early focus on math is critically important. As Crit was saying in her remarks, you know, Kentucky, we were one of the first states to adopt the, the common core standards. And they're called the Kentucky core standards. And look, I'm all for, I'm all for local control of education. But this was not, 
This was not some federal overreach the way that some of the demagogues have been saying. And this was, this was Kentucky saying, we're going to adopt standards and we're going to try to move forward. And, and as a measure of college and career readiness, now in about five years, we've gone from 31% of our students college and career ready to 62%. It's not perfect, but folks, let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Uh, let's continue to, to monitor this. I, I believe a couple years ago, uh, Kentucky adopted the next generation science standards. Um, so we need to focus on math, STEM education at the earliest ages possible. I think that's the way to do it. Um, we've got a new education commissioner coming in, uh, Dr. Pruitt. I have not met him yet. I look forward to talking with him, but talking with him about how can we really put the value on, um, on math and, and, and those, applied, uh, those applied learning skills at the earliest earliest stage possible. I mean, heck, folks, I, I started out my week this Monday. I went to an elementary school in Louisville at about 8 a.m. on Monday, and there were a bunch of eight and nine-year-olds, and they had a STEM project in their STEM lab. This was in a public school, and uh, they wanted to make a Jack Conway bobblehead to sell, sell at the PTA, but it was the students, they had written their own program in this camera type thing, so I had eight and nine-year-olds that literally, I sat in this chair, and they sort of in a circumference went around my head, which you, know, you always very insecure after you see your head in 360, but they kind of went around and, and did this thing and they were talking about how they'd helped write the program and what they were going to do with it and how they were going to take it and apply it and create bobbleheads and sell it to PTA. So it was really cool to see, see eight, nine-year-olds you know, using computers like that, but we need more of that. I mean, we need more of that sort of stuff and um, that's something that I'm going to try to make certain that we're doing as we implement the Kentucky core standards our way, but let's not let the demagoguery get in the way of the, of the progress that we're making. As those children hopefully transition to higher education, uh, it's been cut several times over yeah. the last several years. Uh, the recession is one of many problems that have had, but <coughs> as the, we've come out of the recession, Kentucky was one of only, I think, three states to continue to cut higher education funding. What do you see that funding looking like under the Conway administration? Well, hopefully we can improve it and hopefully we can be smarter. Um, I want to be careful because I don't want to overpromise and underdeliver. I mean, we've got challenges with the Medicaid budget. We have challenges with pensions. Um, we need to get some of the money back into, into education, including higher education. Um, and but you know, there's not enough money for everything. And um, I am going to have to challenge the higher education system to be more efficient. You know, I've said earlier on, you know, my two priorities, if we have enhanced revenues for the next budget, will be to make that ARC payment for the state employees get money into early childhood education and get some of the cuts back into education. So if we can get some back in, um, I will try to do that. But you know, I would just be cautious that there's not enough money around for everything. The higher education system is very important to the economic development here in, of the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Um, you know, we need to have a big conversation about does every degree that comes out of one of our public institutions, does it require four years? Can it be done in two or three? Um, I'm all for building new buildings if it helps lure research talent, have the universities looked and recognized that some of the classrooms of the future are actually the internet. And one of the things here in Kentucky that we haven't done really well is we haven't thought about higher education here as a system. And I know I keep going back to writing that bill in 1997. We were trying to get our institutions of higher learning to think of themselves as a system. Unfortunately, Steve Byers, with all due respect, I love UK, but the 100 year history of, of this of this commonwealth is that each university would you know work certain legislators and that they would come up during the session and they would fight with each other for more funding almost to the detriment of other schools in the system and as a governor i'm going to be going to be constantly encouraging our universities to think of themselves as a system how can they get more efficient how can they keep tuition costs down uh, how can they provide better services to our students uh, how can they make certain that if a student is taking a credit somewhere that it transfers if there's someone that's got excellence in teaching in Murray, can they also take the classes at Western? How can we achieve efficiencies in this system that will allow us uh, to keep the cost of tuition down? Because I do fear, I do fear that we've priced too many middle class students out of the cost of higher education in this state. And, and there are a lot of things that I want to do. And I, and I want to stand by our universities. I want to help them with their budgets. Uh, I want to give them as much flexibility in P3 as they, as they can have. Um, look, I'd love to do another round of bucks for brains funding. I think it's great. I think it's great for UK and U of L. You know, I have concerns that the last round didn't have the, the the requisite minimum endowments. But you know, if I can get into the budget sometime in, in in my first four years and figure out a way to maybe bond some money, 
uh, for Bucks for Brains, I think that's a great investment in partnering higher education up with economic development opportunities. But those are some of the things I'm going to be looking at. Those are some of the things I'm going to be uh, talking about. But if we get some money back into the higher education system, it's going to be because they're also working to achieve efficiencies. Been a lot of talk about coal, uh, the loss of coal jobs, which has been devastating in eastern Kentucky. And in addition to that, you have to also look at, uh, it's been a main factor in our low electric rates, which have drawn uh, the aluminum industry, the automotive industry, we're a heavy user of electricity, but it's for a pretty good reason that yeah. creates a lot of jobs. And as, as the federal government rolls out the new um, clean power plan, which requires Kentucky to cut carbon emissions by 32%, I, I saw recently in the paper that you had recommended, if I'm read it correctly, to, to halt the state implementation plan mm -hmm. until the lawsuit is settled. Can you talk a little bit about um, what your strategy would be going forward as it relates to that? Well, sure. Um, you know, coal has been a, a very important part of Kentucky's economy for a long, long time. And, um, you know, I came up, we've talked a lot about the Pat administration, you know, I came up under Governor Pat. He, he was constantly hammering home how important Kentucky coal is. I mean, working for that administration, I even wrote tax credits, the thin seam tax credits, to make it easier to mine hard to reach coal. I mean, Governor Patton keeps a bumper sticker on the back of his car that says, mine every lump, Rocky. I mean, that's going to be his theory. Um, and, and what Kentucky, what Kentucky's always had has been low electricity rates. I mean, because of coal, coal-fired generation, good arterial transportation, prudent regulation by the Public Service Commission for the most part, uh, Kentucky has always had some of the lowest electricity rates uh, east of the Rocky Mountains. And as you said, that's how we lure auto jobs here. And I'm worried about that low cost of power advantage. The, the new clean power plan, that particular regulation, got its start because a number of the states up northeast sued the EPA. And as part of the settlement, the EPA agreed to promulgate this rule. And Kentucky wasn't at the table. We weren't at the table. And you know those states up northeast would just love to drive our cost of power up. And there's some of that lurking in the background here. And folks, look, I'm not a global warming denier. I'm not. But Kentucky coal is not the sole cause of, of, this, of this particular problem. And when you look at the, the clean power plan, they haven't gone about it the right way. They, they are regulating under the wrong section of the Clean Air Act. They're not supposed to be able to regulate two separate uh, emission sources under, under one section, under 111D. Uh, when they retrofit a, when you retrofit a plant, you're supposed to go into the new source category. They've completely, completely ignored that. Um, and also, also, they're supposed to release the science behind the proposed rule. You know, I'm the only Democratic attorney general in the country that sued on this. I joined some Republicans, uh, the Republican AG of West Virginia, and I asked for the science over a year ago. Haven't seen it. Um, another lawsuit we had on the, on the so-called Matz rule went up to the Supreme Court just this summer. And the Supreme Court ruled that when the EPA does something like this, they have to do a cost-benefit analysis. Carla, there's no cost-benefit analysis here. There's none. So they haven't followed the provisions of their own governing statute. They've gone about this in the wrong way. And I'm not going to let that agency overreach and go about this in the wrong way to the extreme, the extreme detriment uh, of the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Additionally, you know, they, they, they had a proposed rulemaking process that went on for I don't know, Leslie, what, a couple years, something like that? And they told Kentucky you could meet these guidelines. They were talking to Les Peters. And then the, then the final rule came out, and it was about twice as onerous as the proposed rule. I mean, they literally moved the goalposts on us from the proposed rule to the final rule. I mean, what the heck was the, what the, heck was the point of the proposed rulemaking process in the first place? So, look, folks, I, I'm a Democrat, but I put people over politics, and I will always put Kentucky first. And if I see this administration doing something like that to the state I love and to the economy that we have to try to build together, I'm going to stand up for Kentucky first. Is your hope that the lawsuit would result in, in the plan going away completely and it being reduced back to that 18 or 19 percent they, that they it need was? To, they need to go back to square one. I mean, they haven't done a cost-benefit analysis. They haven't released their science. They haven't regulated under the right provisions of the Clean Air Act. And what I said, to your earlier comment, what I said is I'm not going to submit a state implementation plan while that lawsuit was pending. Because I, I, I lived through our challenge to the Matz lawsuit, and we got to the Supreme Court and we won. But you know, along the way, utility companies started retiring coal-fired generation because they thought they had to comply with a rule that in the end the Supreme Court struck down. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, as long as that lawsuit is pending, I'm not going to issue a state implementation plan. And if they try to force us to, I'm going to go to court. 
and say, wait a minute, we've got a, we've got a lawsuit that has a very good chance of winning on the merits, and you may be forcing us to do something that's not necessary. And I'm going to be as aggressive as I can be in standing up for the coal industry Kentucky, in Kentucky, but also our low cost of energy advantage. And that was going to be my other question. The, the risk in not doing a state implementation plan would be that the feds come in with the federal implementation plan, which I think everybody fears look, would be even more onerous, do you well, think, than look, that would it, happen because everything's, of the lawsuit? Everything's on the table, Carla. I mean, not submitting a plan, um, being aggressive in litigation. I don't think the courts, I don't think the courts are going to require us to implement a state implementation plan when we have a lawsuit that's this meritorious that's going on. I don't think the courts will require us to submit a state implementation plan when the Supreme Court was very clear with the EPA in this decision from this past summer. I just don't foresee that. Now, if, if the federal government is coming in here to shove something down our throat that's uh, going to really hurt us, everything's on the table. I'll bring everybody in for a conversation. We'll figure out the best way to comply and challenge at the same time. But, but you know, I am not going to, I'm not going to issue a state implementation plan while this very meritorious lawsuit, which I think we're eventually going to win, uh, is still in the courts. Okay. I want to open it up to uh, everybody for questions, but ask a few quick rapid fire okay. questions. Local option sales tax. How do you feel about it? Well, uh, you know, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with giving the people in the community the opportunity to vote themselves a way to finance a project that has a sunset in it. So I think it's a good way to go about financing local projects. Minimum wage increases at the local level, state level, federal level, all of the above, where do you think it should be done? I support Governor Bashir's uh, executive order that for state contractors and state employees, we have a minimum wage of $10.10 an hour. Um, I support an increase in the minimum wage. I think it's time to, uh, to, to give workers a raise. My strong preference is that the federal Congress actually do its job. I'd hate to see certain states become islands and that creates additional administrative costs for certain businesses. But I do think it's time to give workers a raise uh, um, and, and that's, that's something I believe in. You mentioned uh, P3 public-private partnerships. Is that something that you support? I do. I do support P3s. Now look, they're not perfect for every project, and, but it's important to have that tool in the toolbox as an option to finance finance buildings or roads or, or things moving forward. I mean, this broadband initiative that's building out the middle mile to all 120 counties that Governor Bashir has just started, which I'm determined to finish, that's a P3 project. That's a P3 project. And uh, I'm supportive of that, and I'm supportive of having that flexibility. And, you know, I have an opponent in this race who's spoken out against P3s. And I think having that, that tool in the toolbox is useful. Okay. Final question on right to work. Mm -hmm. Where do you stand on right to work? Um, I don't support right to work. Uh, first of all, the local ordinances that have been passed clearly are illegal. It's been, a, it's been black letter law now for 50 years that local or, uh, governments cannot do this. Uh, secondly, when you look at right to work, Indiana passed right to work a few years ago, and we've outpaced them in manufacturing jobs since their passage. If you look at states that, that um, have right to work laws, uh, their workers make on average $1,500 less uh, per worker. So uh, I think it's sort of a solution looking for a problem. I don't want to do anything to drive down wages in Kentucky. All right, it's your turn. Anybody have any questions? Hey, Carl, I'll start it off and uh, thank you for uh, how you've conducted the interview. It's been very good. General Conway. Okay. You didn't have time to touch on transportation, but... Uh, I knew you uh, would be here to... <laughs> I'm a big advocate of aviation. It's our largest industry in aerospace manufacturing. is also our largest export industry. And, and uh, so we're right concerned about the airports in Kentucky and wonder if you've uh, had any opportunity to study the issues on aviation and, of course, transportation. Secretary Hancock would like to try to have some kind of a transportation-oriented system rather than something that's dictated by highways because of our way we fund our highway programs. And so. Um, it's a kind of a large question in terms of waterways, railroads, aviation, yeah, highways, and so forth. But you've got 30 seconds. I've got 30 seconds, yeah, okay. Well, let me say this. Um, aeronautics and aerospace being our number one import, I mean export, excuse me, is, is a huge boon to this economy. Um, I love the work that Moorhead University is doing to try to develop the next, the next generation of workers working um, in that particular industry. Um, and look, we need, we need better air service in this state. I mean, if you're going to lure the jobs of the future here, people want connectivity. They want connectivity uh, on the internet with broadband. They also want connectivity in getting to where they can go. Uh, so we've got to look at expanding air service. Uh, I think the Northern Kentucky Airport is a huge untapped research, resource up there, folks. We have so much infrastructure up there, and ever since Delta 
pulled out their hub, you know, there's just so much infrastructure up there going unused. And um, uh, I know it's important for some local officials in Kenton County to maintain, you know, some control there, but I don't, you know, I'm, I'm not supportive of that. That's going to be a regional solution. I'm going to get with leaders in Ohio and Cincinnati. Uh, we need to expand that board to make really take a regional approach and come up with a strategic plan both for passenger service and logistics out of that particular airport uh, because we've got so much there that we could really, really build upon. And um, so yes, I'm, I'm focused on, I'm focused on on air service. Uh, I also think in transportation, uh, I'm glad we did get a floor on the motor fuels tax. It, at least saved a portion of our of our road fund. Um, Secretary Hancock has been very conservative in what he's held back in reserves. Uh, I do believe in being conservative, but I do think we can get an additional couple hundred million dollars out the year out the door in in road projects next year just by looking at that reserve and what the level ought to be. Right, Leslie. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a quick question. Sure. You've got one of the best lieutenant governor candidates that I can remember here as a running mate uh, in a long time. I'm just curious with such a talented person, how do you see utilizing her in your administration? <laughs> um, well, I've been fortunate that, that Sandy um, said yes and has been my running mate. She has been an ideal running mate. And I know many of you being Lexingtonians, you know Sandy. She represents part of Fayette County. You know, Sandy grew up on a, on a family farm in Bourbon County. She became an engineer, worked in the transportation cabinet, then put herself through law school at night, opened a law practice in Bourbon County, got elected to the legislature, chaired the budget subcommittee on transportation, which writes the road plan, and then Sandy <laughs> became the first woman, the first woman in the history of Kentucky elected to House leadership. Sandy is a, Sandy is a trailblazer. She's going to be an integral part of our administration, and I often say I'd like my two little girls to grow up to be like my wife, but if they grew up to be like Sandy, I'd be one proud papa, I can tell you that. Uh, Sandy is going to have a multitude of roles, and part of that's going to be determined by Sandy. Um, it's, uh, ever since Barrett and Jones changed the way we elect governors and lieutenant governors in this state, what you've had is sort of on the front end of the process, these marriages of convenience or people getting together for regional reasons or political reasons. Uh, Sandy and I truly are partners. And um, you're not going to have any of that infighting in our administration. Um, you know, I could foresee a situation where Sandy takes a specific role uh, on transportation issues because of her expertise as an engineer and having worked in the transportation cabinet and written, and written the road plan. Um, Sandy also has a keen interest in agriculture and agricultural issues. I could see her taking a, a role there as well. Uh, the other thing that Sandy has said to me on several occasions is that if we're honored enough to be elected, she may not want to pigeonhole herself. That, that she would want to be there um, a, a, as a partner helping to make all the decisions of the administration. So uh, that's one of those November the 4th problems, which will be a good problem to have. Uh, unlike my opponent, I'm not going to get up here in front of you today and tell you I'm already putting a cabinet together or I'm taking resumes or anything like that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run through the finish line. I'm going to run through the finish line on November the 3rd. But um, if I'm honored enough to be the next governor, um, the person sitting at my side helping put it all that together will be Sandy Oberly. She's remarkably talented. She's ready to be governor for day one if that circumstance should arise. And that's something that people ought to take a look at as they make their decision here in the last in the last 10 days. But I could foresee a number of roles for her. And uh, she's going to be able to carve a lot of that out herself because she is so remarkably talented. Okay. We have time for one more question. All right. Well, thank you, General Conway, for taking the time. Well, thank you all very much.